Welcome the Young Minds of Class 8. I am Nancy Bora, your digital mentor. Today we will start with Chapter 4 of History, Crafts and Industry. So let's get the ball rolling. Today we are going to talk about Decline of Indian Handicrafts, Development of Modern Industry, Case Study of the Indian, in, case study of the Indian Textile Industry, Decline of Export of Indian Textile and Drain Theory. Now let's familiarize ourselves with some history terms. First is Handicrafts. Any artwork which is produced by manual labor rather than by machine is known as handicrafts. Calico, a coarse cotton cloth is known as calico. Till the middle of the 18th century, Indian handicraft products were in great demand, specifically in the European markets. Indian silk and cotton textiles held their own foreign markets. The village artisans such as weavers, carpenters and potters met various needs of the people. They produced coarse cloth, various kinds of implements and domestic vessels on a small scale for rough and ready use. They inherited these occupations running in the family for generation. Here is an image of Indian silk textile. The European traders and trading organization made huge profit by selling Indian products. The poverty of Indian people was due to British exploitation of Indian resources and the drain of India's wealth to Britain without any adequate return. But by the 19th century, the demand of Indian textile declined across the world. Thousands of Indian weavers lost their source of living. The British disrupted the traditional structure of Indian economy in two ways. First, by taking away raw materials to England for processing and second, by bringing the finished products to the Indian market. Now let's talk about decline of Indian handicrafts. The textile industry grew in Britain, which affected the Indian textile industry in many ways. The Calico Act was withdrawn in 1770 and heavy duties were imposed on Indian goods entering Western market. In the European and the American markets, the Indian textile had to compare with cheaper machine-made British textiles. Imposition of high duties also made it difficult for Indians exporting Indian textiles. The English cotton textile successfully replaced Indian cotton textiles in the African, American and European markets. Here is an image of traditional handicraft. Now, let's connect to history. Custom duties help a native country's industry to survive. Today, if chocolates like sneakers and marks, imported chocolates, are exempted from custom duties, they would be lesser or equivalent to the price of Indian chocolates like Cadbury or Amul. As a result, if consumers prefer imported chocolates at the same or lesser price, then Indian chocolate industries would be shut down. So, to protect native industry, custom duties are imposed. Additionally, the British Parliament made export of machine-made British textile in the Indian market compulsory. This resulted in a change of scene. The company traders, rather than purchasing Indian clothes for export, now promoted the European clothes in Indian market for sale. The expensive handmade Indian clothes could not compare with cheaper European textile. This led to deindustrialization in India. Now, let's talk about an extract from history of British India from 1805 to 1835. The history of the trade of cotton clothes with India is a melancholy. Instance of the wrong done to India by the country on which she had become dependent. It was stated in evidence that the cotton and silk goods of India up to this period could be sold for a profit in British market at a price from 50 to 60 percent lower than those fabricated in England. It consequently became necessary to, to protect the latter by duties of 70 and 80 percent on their value or by positive prohibition. Had this not been the case, the mills of Paisley and the Manchester would have been stopped at their outset. They were created by the sacrifice of Indian manufacturer. Here is an image of spinning jenny. Now, thousands of spinners and weavers in India could not sell their goods and became unemployed. British cotton clothes flooded the Indian market by the 1830s. Moreover, as the company gained more control in India, the Indian rulers lost their power. This affected the Indian handicraft industry as these rulers had provided patronage to many artists and craftspeople. Their livelihood was lost and many shifted to village for agriculture. Major industrial centers such as Dhaka in the east, Petboli, Masuli Patnam in the south and Varanasi in the north became deserted. India now turned into a supplier of raw materials from a flourishing trade centre. India was drained of its wealth while the British trade grew and traders became rich. 
However, this did not result in a complete destruction of handloom weaving. Many intricate designs and pattern could not be made by machines. Demand for some traditional clothes was still high among the rich as well as the middle classes. Additionally, the coarse cloth used by some Indians for rough use was not being made in British mills. Later, the national movement also helped in sustaining the traditional cotton textile industry in India. Mahatma Gandhi promoted charkha as a symbol of self-reliance and the use of khadi and urged people to boycott clothes made in English mills. Here is an image of a charkha. Now, let's talk about decline of export of Indian textiles. From the beginning of the 18th century, the wool and silk makers in England were jealous of the popularity of Indian textile and started protesting against the import of Indian cotton textiles. In 1720, the British government passed a law banning the use of printed cotton textile called chins in England. At this time, the cotton textile industry was just beginning to develop in England. The manufacturers were unable to compete with Indian textiles. They wanted to sell their goods in the country by preventing the entry of Indian textile. The parliament prohibited the import of all dyed cloth, which was followed by a complete ban on the use of printed calicoos in England. Here is an image of a cotton mill in England. As cotton industry developed in England, the industrial groups pressurized the government to impose duty on cotton textiles coming from outside so that the goods manufactured within the country could be easily sold. At the same time, the industrial group which viewed India, at the same time, the industrial groups viewed India as a vast market for their mill-made goods. They persuaded the East India Company to sell British manufactured goods in India. The machine-made goods were so cheap that weavers could not compete with them. Now, let's connect to history once again. Even after the rise of modern industry in the country after World War I, the process of deindustrialization of India continued. It meant a fall in the percentage of workers in the agricultural sector. In the years 1881 to 1911, the proportion of the working force engaged in manufacturing, mining and construction fell by half from 35% to 17%. According to census report, between 1901 to 1941 alone, the percentage of population dependent on agriculture increased from 63.7% to 70%. By the middle of the 19th century, the weavers faced a new problem. The raw cotton was exported to England and it was difficult to find the fine quality raw cotton. As the demand increased, the price of the raw cotton rose exorbitantly. By 1880, two-thirds of all cotton clothes worn by Indians were made of cloth produced in England. This affected not only the weavers but also the spinners. Thousands of rural women who lived by spinning were rendered jobless. Here is an image of raw cotton. Now let's talk about after the declining of textile industry. After the decline of the textile industry, many weavers became agricultural labourers. Some migrated to the city in search of job. Some went to work on the plantations, others became indentured labourers under contract and went to work in Mauritius, Fiji Islands, Guyana. Some others got jobs in the new textile mills which were being set up in Bombay, Kanpur and other places. Now let's talk about development of modern industries. Growth of Indian industries took place around 1850s and 60s, though very slowly. The British wanted India to always remain its colony which could be exploited for furthering of British interests. As an effect of the industrial revolution in England, in India too, indigenous craftsmanship was replaced by a modern and mechanized industrial system. The British improved the plantation industry for their own gain. Cultivation of food crops was replaced by cash crops like indigo, tea, coffee, jute, cinchona, rubber, sugarcane and oil seeds. In Bihar and Bengal, indigo was an important plantation crop. It was used to dye clothes. Another important plantation crop that was grown in Assam, Bengal and South India was tea and coffee. Sincona and rubber plantation were mostly located in many states of South India. In the second half of the 19th century, modern mechanized industries were set up by the British. This brought a complete overhaul to the industrial scenario in India. The industry which developed during this time was cotton, jute, coal, iron and steel, sugar and cement. Here is an image of coal mining. Here is an image of cotton industry. Now let's talk about cotton textile industry. 
Cotton mills were mostly set up in Ahmedabad, Bombay and Madras. The first cotton mill was set up in Bombay in 1854 by a Parsi merchant Kavasji Nanabhai. These industry produced cotton yarn for Indian cottage industry. India succeeded in making its position among the top textile industries of the world. Now let's talk about jute industry. Jute industry developed in the middle of the 19th century. The jute industry was mostly Bengal based. However, the owners of the jute industries were mostly British. The first jute mill was established in Rishra near Calcutta. In 1887, there were around 20 jute mills employing a large number of people. Soon, jute emerged as a major item of export. Now, let's talk about iron and steel industry. India had the great reputation of producing quality iron and steel since ages long ago. The iron pillar of Chandragupta Vikramaditya at Mehroli still stand witness to this fact. Later on the Mughals as well as Tipu Sultan of Mysore greatly contributed to this craft. It is said that Tipu Sultan's sword which was made of high quality steel known as boots was a great terror for the British. Here is an image of Tipu Sultan's sword. But in the 19th century the art of smelting iron was on the decline because of the loss of royal patronage and the loss made by the foreign rulers. In more villages the furnaces fell into disuse and the production of iron came down drastically the forest law prevented the people from entering the reserve forests then how could the iron smelters get wood for making charcoal which could be used in furnaces thus they were forced to abandon their ancestral craft of smelting iron however under the colonial rule the iron and steel industry one of the basic industries had a humble beginning In the 19th century its production was limited to only 35000 tons in the early years of 20th century a significant step was the formation of Tata Iron and Steel Company Tisco now Tata Steels in the Singhbhum district of Bihar in 1911 the world war 1 provided a big opportunity to carry out the expansion of its plants various factors helped the Tisco to expand steel production during the first world war Firstly as a result of the war it became quite impossible for the british government to send their steel consignments to india secondly now all steel that used to be produced in england was required to meet the demands of the war material that was essential to save britain from the onslaughts of the german forces and their allies thirdly tisco was asked by the british government to produce shells and carriages wheels for the war Fourthly, forced by circumstances, the Indian Railways turned to Tisco for the supply of rails. In this way, according to an estimate, by 1990, the British government was forced to buy 90% of the steel manufactured by Tisco. As a result, within the next few years, Tisco became the biggest steel industry within the British Empire. Soon, many other steel companies were established in West Bengal and Mysore also. The excessive demands created by World War II further encouraged the industry and by 1939 a good variety of iron and steel products like pig iron, finished steel and steel ingots began to be produced. Here is an image of Jamshedji Nusarwanji Tata, the founder of Tisco. Now let's talk about other industries. The cement industry was also established around this period. Other industries of import were paper matches and the glass industry. Thus the growth of Indus industries though slow and erratic was quite notable. Now let's talk about drain theory. Dada Bhai Naro ji was the first man to say that the internal factors were not the reasons of poverty in India but poverty was caused by the colonial rule that was draining the wealth and prosperity of India. In 1867 Dada Bhai Naro ji put forward the drain of wealth theory in which he stated that the Britain was completely draining India. He mentioned this theory in his book Poverty and Un-British Rule in India. He also stated the loss of millions of pounds of revenue to Britain. Dada Bhai Naro ji considered it as a major evil of British in India. On the footsteps of Dada Bhai Naro ji, R.C. Dutt also promoted the same theory by keeping it as a major theme of his book Economic History in India. Dada Bhai Naro ji gave various factors that caused extreme drain. These are first external rule and administration in india second all the civil administration and army expenses of britain were paid by india third india was further exploited by opening the country to free trade fourth 
major earners in India during British rule were foreigners. The money they earned was never invested in India to buy anything. Moreover, they left India with that money. Fifth, through different services such as railways, India was given a huge amount to Britain. Trade as well as Indian labour was deeply undervalued. Along with this, the East India Company was buying products from India with Indian money and exporting it to Britain. Dada Bhai Naroji was respected both in Britain as well as in India for his loyalty towards British and services for Indians. For this reason, he was elected as the President of Indian National Congress not once or twice but for three times. Students, so now let's wrap up and see what we have learned so far. Till the middle of the 18th century, Indian handicraft products were in great demand. Second, the decline of Indian handicrafts did not occur all of a sudden, rather it came to be systematically ruined by the British. In the 19th century, India faced severe deindustrialization. India was made subservient to the empire and vast wealth and was sucked out of the subcontinent. Some of the important industries that developed in India in the second half of the 19th century were the iron and steel industry, jute industry, textile industry and sugar industry. Student, that was it for today. I hope that you have learned something. We'll meet again in the next class.